everyone, James Mansell here bringing you yet another video and it's yet another makeup video. Why? Because I got PR and when I get free makeup, I try and get as much out of it as possible. All right, so we are going to be trying out some of Trixie Mattel's newest collection, the Insider Collection. So these are the insiders. We have two new lipsticks and three new lip glosses and they are fabulous. Now story time. If you go on the little mini bites of Hey Queen, they have this little interview with Trixie where she's dressed in a leopard print dress with leopard print gloves. And she said to Johnny McGovern, you know, I took a picture of James Mansfield to my designer and said, can you make me a dress like this? Well, I decided since she wants to mop my look, two can play that game. I'm gonna mop her look. Yes, that's right. I am gonna come for Trixie Mattel's gig in this video. Drama, hit the screen right here. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Jake Yancey, you listening? All right, here we go. We are going to do a Trixie Mattel inspired look. Now, to be fair, I have only attempted this look once, not with the camera rolling, and it did not turn out that well. So we'll, we'll see how this looks. It might be like, you know, a Trixie Mattel fan made doll left out in the sun and, you know, made to melt. We'll see, we'll see. Now this is my single half white female tutorial. Hit it. I don't know why I said hit it. <laughs> All right, there's no transition here. Transition. <laughs> I transitioned because I felt like it. Now, I'm going to block out my eyebrows so that we can do this look because I'm gonna use a lot of makeup. And I also have to work around having hair on my head. It's so hard having hair on my head. Trixie, what's that? Oh, you wouldn't know, would you? Anyways, let's block out our eyebrows. Jesus Christ, this thing is sealed. Okay, pros aid, comb through my brow hairs and we are going to glue down our eyebrows. And this may or may not happen on camera because it's kind of boring and you already know what I'm doing here. I have a tutorial on this on my channel, so just scroll down below, you'll find it. It'll be listed. <laughs> All right, I am back. I decided to do my foundation and everything off camera because I didn't know how this eyebrow is gonna turn out. You never really know, so I wanted to make sure I didn't waste my time here, okay? So let's jump ahead to our contour because we got a lot to do today, all okay? right? Doing her makeup is a chore, it is a lot, so. We're gonna try and make it happen. In the meantime, I thought we could discuss a little more history because that was fun. You guys seemed to like that last time. So we gonna do it again. I decided since we were doing Tracy Martell, we should go into the, like a little bit of a brief history of camp drag. More like a discussion. Consider this like a history course at college or like a community college or like you maybe somebody talking on the street trying to tell you what's going on with that because that's essentially what you're getting here. I'm not by any means a professor. I just know what I know and what I've discovered over the years. So just roll with it, all right? And it's all gay drag history and most of it's mythology at this point anyway. A lot of this shit was not written down. One of my favorite camp queens is, has to be Divine. She's probably one of my very first drag inspirations. Love her. Most people know her from pictures and images. A lot of people haven't even seen her films. Now I noticed like people know who she is, but they've never seen a Divine movie outside of like maybe Hairspray. But before she was Edna Turnblad, which is also not a very good showing for her drag. She was a fabulous drag queen that came from Baltimore, Maryland and was predominantly known for working with, oop, my bad. <laughs> was predominantly known for working with John Waters, the director in indie films in Baltimore in the 1970s. And for those of you who don't know who John Waters is, it's basically, you have to know who John Waters is in order to know who Divine is. Their histories are pretty intertwined. You cannot talk about one without talking about the other. John Waters is still alive and he is a critically acclaimed now director of cult camp movies. Probably his most shocking movie to date that he will probably never top is Pink Flamingos which was not his first movie. It was his first mainstream movie. It was the first movie that broke through, but it's definitely not the best one. And that certainly wasn't the first. But in that, Divine played a criminal who basically was obsessed with having the title of being the filthiest woman alive. And she ended up getting into a competition with two other people who challenged her for said title. And they would do horrible things like shoplift meat and shove it down their underwear. Like stuff I can't even go into detail on in this YouTube video. <laughs> but you can find the Pink Flamingos. It is out there. Definitely pick up the DVD and give John Waters your support. But that was the thing that really shocked people into paying attention to Divine. And I feel like the one thing I can mention, which is the one thing her career never really escaped, was her eating dog poop. And it was something they honestly, they, something they always asked John Waters in interviews and something they always terrorized Divine with in interviews when she was trying to promote her albums and her singing career afterwards. Anytime she's on a talk show, they always asked her that question. Followed her the rest of her career. 
What I adored about her is if you listen to early interviews with John Waters, he discusses Divine's drag, her early drag as they were friends, as basically she wanted to be like a pageant girl. She liked being pretty. She wanted to like Elizabeth Taylor. She didn't want to be, you know, the shocking punk rock Drake we know her as. She was kind of square when she dressed up in drag and you saw old pictures of her. She did look like, you know, Tony Fields. It was not definitely like, you know, the mohawked out punk rock eyebrows at the back of the head Drake when we know today. That was all a creation of Van Smith and John Waters and a little bit of Divine's input as well. Just, you know, to portray a character in a film. And it all just sort of became the image that was divine and she ran with it afterwards. And she honestly couldn't escape it. She was trying to escape it her whole career so she wouldn't have to be in drag anymore. She wanted to be a serious actor. Part of a thing with drag queens I notice whenever they get the public eye and they really hit it big, a lot of them, they go through that period where they want to like be a drag queen and they get through, they break through the surface, right? But then they want to be taken seriously as an actor and they leave the drag behind for a little bit. It's happened quite often. Which is understandable, you know, you don't want to be known for just one thing. But I always thought it was really, really fascinating. The second someone gets famous, they want to do something else. Me, honestly, I'll probably be doing this till I'm 70. At least until my hands don't work no more. I always found it fascinating how, like, she wanted to really walk away from drag. She didn't want to be doing it her whole career. She wanted to have a lot more than what drag could offer her. And especially in the 1980s, your career was awfully limited as to what you could do as a professional drag queen. And she managed to like break the mold to be, you know, a pop artist in other countries. And even then, critics didn't really seem to take her seriously. Like I remember seeing interviews with her on like, you know, Berlin pop shows where they're asking her like, what do you see yourself as? Do you see yourself as, you know, something more or just somebody that's gonna play, you know, gay clubs the rest of their lives? And she's almost taken aback and a little insulted by it. Like, of course I see myself as more, like, why wouldn't I? And it's like that was kind of the attitude that she was presented with constantly when she was trying to, you know, bridge out and do different things and try and make her drag go as far as it possibly could to that era. Like this is before, this is pre RuPaul. This is pre, you know, drag queens really making a serious breakthrough. The most we had seen like that was probably David Bowie or Sylvester. Like Divine was one of the first, very first out there in full drag doing it. And the John Waters films, honestly, like I think they're all masterpieces. I'm just a super fan. And I was lucky enough to meet John Waters when I was in Provincetown. And he is honestly like an intimidating presence. Like very few people will make me starstruck. John Waters is one of them where I was just sitting there like <laughs> in full drag even. Like even with the gay suit of armor, I'm sitting there like speechless. Like, oh my God, I adore this person. They are right in front of me. When I mentioned that his name James Mansfield, he got very, very excited because he's a huge Jane Mansfield fan and was trying to talk to me about a book that her assistant had written, which is a pack of lies. It was all sensationalized, but it was like really fascinating some of the stuff he came up with. And like just sitting there talking about, you know, Jane Mansfield doing LSD in the middle of a bookshop in Provincetown. Like those are some great moments. Now, some of my favorite Divine stories actually came from when I was staying in Provincetown and like workshopping a show there. Everybody that's basically above the age of 40 ran a divine at some point down there. It's so small and it's like the traffic of the world as far as queerness goes through there. And so my favorite stories I had heard, which actually were documented in the newspaper, these did happen. The first one I heard was around Christmas time. Divine was living in a cottage in Provincetown. He was, you know, a townie there for a long time and he wanted a Christmas tree. So he decided he was going to go out there and be rustic and chop one down. So. He scouted the whole area for Christmas trees and found one that he wanted. He found this great glorious pine, brought a full axe. He imagined like what Divine's like, you know, lumberjack togs look like. And he starts chopping down this tree and somebody runs out of a cottage and screams, Hey, get out of my yard. You're chopping down my tree. And Divine, not even listening, puts the tree over his shoulder and carries it off and takes it home. Later to find out the person's tree he had cut down belonged to the town sheriff. Another one is like so unbelievable when I'm hearing about it. Like, Picture it, Divine on a golf cart with Hollywood Lawn from the Warhol factory. They are just driving through town. Divine is driving, speeding, and not looking where they're going. He gets distracted by a sign in the Pilgrim House that says, Divine, live tonight. And he looks, he keeps looking at it, but he's not looking at the road, and makes a sharp turn and goes right through the window of the hardware store across the street. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been talking an awful lot about Divine. She was by no means the only drag queen carrying on at that point. Camp is always a pretty easy one to go through because they're probably the most documented comedy. Everyone likes to laugh, so it's pretty easy to find 
a lot of the stuff from girls back in those days. Also, you guys like this stuff. This is that Wet n Wild eyeliner. This is like a classic for me. I can't use it for this kind of makeup because one eye will dry the whole thing up. So I'm just gonna do the outline and then do the rest, but still. Anyways, stop getting distracted, James. Camp girls, one of my very favorite camp girls would have to be Craig Russell. If y'all don't know who that is, Craig Russell was a Canadian drag performer from the 1970s to the 1980s, and he even had his life story turned into a movie. Yes, called Outrageous, is loosely based on his actual life, with, you know, a lot of creative liberties taken, but this is how fierce he was. Craig Russell starred as himself in his own movie. And it's actually really, really cute. It was based off of the book, The Butterfly Ward. There was a short story by the woman who wrote it, based on her time living with Craig Russell in Toronto in the 1960s and 70s, and you know, having a drag queen roommate and this straight girl who was go dealing with schizophrenia. It's really, really fascinating. I definitely recommend checking it out. And Outrageous is taking a lot of creative liberties with it, but it is an entertaining movie and it definitely captures a time capsule of a time. Like before any of this, back when you know, like how gay life was in the 1970s, especially in Canada, I don't, I didn't know a whole lot about that. So it's fascinating getting like a portal back to that time. As soon as I fill this in, I'll have every Midwest drag queen's makeup after season seven. <laughs> Craig Russell was probably best known for his imitations. That was a really, really big thing in the 1960s and 70s. Drag queens that did imitations got a lot of press coverage. And Craig Russell was one of the best because he actually could do voices that sounded just like the people he was imitating. His Tula Bankhead, oh my god, it's breathtaking. Or even his Carol Channing, one of the very best you will ever hear. It sounds just like her. And he actually did a Mae West impersonation that got so much attention that Mae West herself hired him to be an assistant. Where was I? Oh yeah, Craig Russell. <laughs> Sorry, I had to like do a lot of this off camera just to make sure I had the precision correct. Now I do, I feel like we can continue. All right. Let's hope this other eyeliner works out. Now, Charles Pierce, girl, is an icon. Oh my God, I adore Charles Pierce. Probably the funniest of the female impersonators that did celebrity impersonations. Like, his are the ones that everyone steals from. He had the funniest one-liners, and even some Drag Race girls, I've heard some of his material <laughs> pop up, but you just can't help it, it's so good. His assistant just recently released a book called Write That Down, where it basically goes into his whole act and how he like constructed it. It's really fascinating. But Charles Pierce, I discussed him a little bit in the previous video of history where he started off in the 1960s as a basically a prop comedian, because that's what you had to do, you couldn't get into full drag. He was famous in San Francisco at the Gilded Cage, that's where he really made his mark and got discovered by Hollywood. And from there, hon, Charles Pierce was everywhere. He was on the gong show. He did all sorts of TV. He was even a villain on Wonder Woman. Yes, girl. A drag queen villain on Wonder Woman. It is incredible. I think it's called like Death in Disguise. And there's this great footage of Charles Pierce in like this Betty Davis wig and his like fright makeup on the phone, disguising his voice as a woman and then suddenly talks as Charles Pierce. He also was a serial killer on Laverne and Shirley. I didn't see that episode, but if it's in drag, let me know. If one of y'all saw that original airing, I think it was like a two-part episode, let me know, because it sounds fascinating. <laughs> My God. Ooh, thank goodness I just follow the features I was given. If I had to do this every single time I do my makeup, I would die. It's so much work. I don't know how Trixie managed to come over here that one time we did a collab video and did her makeup in 40 minutes at my vanity with no lighting. <laughs> If you are lucky enough to come here and film a video, I put you at my vanity because it has the best lighting and it's literally just like very, very dimly lit orange lights that are going out. <laughs> but she pulled it together. I love her. <laughs> okay, I'm back. I had to do some corrections. There was a bit of an eyeliner incident that happened. I don't want to go into it and I was not going to do it on camera because girl, this makeup look has taken long enough. Where was I? All right, I was talking about Charles Pierce, and yeah, she was fabulous. Check out Miss Charles Pierce. And from there, we go to the 1990s. You sort of have like the old guarded drag of, you know, celebrity impersonation was slowly, slowly dying out. You had your Jimmy Jameses and your Jim Baileys. 
Yes, they were still the ones that were doing, you know, the female impersonation and looking as much like a female celebrity of the past as they could. Only the way they approached it, they were very like realism about it. Like they wanted to look exactly like them and sound exactly like them. And Jim Bailey and Jimmy James were amazing vocalists. Check out some of their works. Like Jimmy James is best known for his Marilyn Monroe. And it is breathtaking. When you see the actual Marilyn, photos and the videos of Jimmy as Marilyn are breathtaking. You'd swear it was the real thing. And people have gotten them confused in the past. There's still to this day where people will take pictures of Jimmy James and market it on stuff with Marilyn Monroe and it's completely a picture of Jimmy James that they had no idea. Okay, now it's time to do the nose, the infamous nose contour, the white worm swimming in chocolate pudding. And if it's crooked, it only, you know, goes with the look. It's really close to the real thing then. And I'm going to go with my Gerard Cosmetics Lip Liner. Be sure and use my code JAMES for 30% off your purchase for regular priced items at GerardCosmetics.com. Ooh. All right, now let's get this started because this is whole collection is lipsticks and lip glosses. So we got to use at least one of them. All right, we are going in with her new color, Bobble, which is actually like a pretty little peachy color. Let's try her out. Okay. All right, I am intrigued because with Peaches Girl, they are always, always so streaky. This is actually really cute. She's very smooth. And when I was first starting out Drag Girl, it was impossible to find you a matte peach lipstick. I don't know what it was. At that time, get out of my face, fly. At that time, nobody was making them. And every time you want like a peach lipstick to have like that vintage moment, you always had to settle for something that had like sheen in it. Come on, lip liner, looking like the Mycene dolls from the early 2000s. Anybody have those? I used to love those dolls. Okay, so the lip gloss I'm going to try is Melodrama. Ooh. There are little pink clusters in it. Ooh. Snow cone. What does that one look like? Let me just look quick. Oh. Hmm, this one might partner better with this lipstick. Redo! All right, I have snow cone now. Okay, yeah, that's gonna be fun. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> Summer of love. Easy stuff. Just take some of Side Chick and Girl on Girl. And she does not play around with the blush. Girl looks like she got beat with a bag of oranges. And just to tone that down a bit, I'm going in with Gerard Cosmetics. Code James for 30% off. And I think we're almost ready to go. I just gotta put some lashes on and I'll be right back. <laughs> Should I be one of those Instagram gays about that? They always do like that weird thing, like they take a palette and they lick it. Like, uh, not doing that. Not during this season, not during Corona season. I'll be back. <laughs> Welcome back. This is the final result. Oh, honey. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so this has been an interesting journey for me. Now, isn't it fascinating how I could wear makeup like this? Makeup that's meant to be crazy and I still look stunningly gorgeous. Oh. <laughs> what good bone structure can do. I imagine when Trixie Mattel does hair makeup, this is what she thinks she sees. <laughs> Ooh. And it's interesting doing Trixie makeup because like I imagine many, many years from now, people are gonna look back on Trixie Mattel like that. She may be to the kids today what Divine, Charles Pierce, and all those great entertainers were to me. Although to me personally, she's just another dirt bag that I know from Milwaukee. <laughs> Love you, sis. But I have to say, the Insider Lippy Collection was fabulous. I loved it, especially the lip glosses. Those really hit me by surprise. And I'm glad she finally has a lip color I can wear. A fun nude peach. Now, this look is fabulous, but it is just missing one more thing. The James Bradfield Magical Wig Spray from Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. Let's just give this look a spritz. Now I smell just like cream soda. Available at blackphoenixalchemylab.com. And grooming can be an absolute drag, but thankfully I have Manscaped. <laughs> Use my code Mansfield or James20 for 20% on your purchase plus free shipping. It's for your no-no bits. <laughs> Now, I just say this is a really fun, over the top kind of Barbie look. And as far as it goes, I'd say it's sort of like if you like go to Walgreens, you see like those Walgreens exclusive Barbie dolls for like $7. This is kind of like what you're getting right there. <laughs> also, I found this thing on eBay for $10. Look how crazy this is. <laughs> Barbie. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go pre-record my full coverage Fridays. <laughs> so, until next time, bye. Ooh, it's out of tune, just like her vocals. <laughs> bye. Click here and watch me style a subscriber submitted wig. Or watch me make the biggest hair ever with one wig. Come on, click it. You know you want to. If you don't click it, I'll light 15 fireworks outside your window at 3 a.m. So click it.